Hello, hello, and welcome to another Pilates Hour. And today I have a dear friend and special guest that everybody knows in the movement world, Eric Franklin. So good to have you, Eric. Great to be here. Yeah, I know it's a, it's getting close to, to bedtime in Switzerland, so I appreciate you uh, staying <laughs> stay up four hours for me. I appreciate that. Hey, all of you folks coming on right now, give us a little shout out where you're coming from so Eric and I can see. And we're just sort of looking at the chat to see where our friends from all over the world are coming. By the way, Eric, not for either of us to be nervous, but this is the biggest group we've had register ever in the history in two years of the Polestar Hour. So appreciate your influence. We're, at, we're over 1,400 people that have signed up to either hear us talk today or tonight or that they would get it for 30 days after and get a chance to listen to it so while uh looking at some of the folks from new zealand uk london new jersey paris athens greece a little bit of influence going on there while that's happening eric why don't you just give us a shout out of what's new for the franklin method what are you working on these days i um, I, I've seen some interesting posts coming out lately. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what the, the method's doing. Well, we're constantly evolving. Um, I, you know that we put out a paper on imagery in fascia. So the first paper discussing uh, how imagery could benefit fascia. We know a lot about imagery and muscles, but um, imagery in fascia is a very new topic and we know fascia is highly proprioceptive so uh, we've been working on that and continuing working on that but we've also been working with um, gymnastics so with olympic gymnasts and doing some research research there and then the very newest is looking at another area where uh, there's really very little um, data as yet but we would like to create some is how does imagery actually influence uh, our neurobiology. So uh, really looking at um, synaptic changes and uh, neurodynamic flows and things like that in the brain and nervous system. Well, that's, I mean, that's such a hot topic right now. Like I, I listen a lot to a podcast by uh, Andrew Huberman. But I don't know if you've, you've probably heard of Andrew, but he's always looking for guests to talk about this exact thing. For him, he is a uh, op he specializes in visual and neuro um, at Stanford. And so all of his doctoral work is looking at that. And, and there's just so much work coming out now looking at the biological influence of behavior, whether it is imagery, whether it's speech, whether it's movement or fear or excitement or pleasure and how all of these things interact in shifting our neurobiology. And, um, you know, we, I made a joke not too long ago. I think I called it a, see if I can remember what we call it. It was a biopsycho neuro Lotties class. So <laughs> that same, the same idea. Hey, I would love to know more. Um, maybe just take a minute or two to talk about what you were finding with imagery and fascia. I know that, you know, the fascia gurus have identified just, massive numbers of Golgi organs in the fascia and that particularly have to do with uprightness and orientation to gravity. What are some of the things that you're looking at and that you found with your paper? Well, we found that, uh, you know, most of the things that you can do through movement uh, can be enhanced by adding dynamic imagery. Uh, as we know that uh, imagery alone uh, of course, does not suffice. You need movement, but we do know pretty much across the board that if you combine imagery uh, with exercise, you get better results. So we're finding the same thing with fascia. Yeah, you know, Adrian Lowe um, that talks a lot about pain science and sort of in the Laura Mosley and Butler group that we're familiar with, um, and he talks about that as well, saying that we can do all the education about pain we want, but if we don't create the positive movement experience in conjunction with that or have the movement with it that either reinforces movement equals pain or reinforces movement doesn't equal pain, there is no behavioral shift. There's no change. So 
Uh, it'd be fun to look at everything from education, imagery tools, successful movement experiences. Um, before we and go then, on, by the way, just uh, I'm, I'm doing a webinar on that topic in about two weeks, and it's on the the list of of items that everyone will be able to look at later on. Perfect. Yeah. We'll make sure and and share that and talk a little bit about that. Um, what I want to do before we get rid of the screen, Eric, is I, I have two interaction uh, slides that I like the group to do. They're going to go to menti.com and just punch in that code. And I just have two questions today, everybody, two things that are going to help Eric and I navigate our conversation to uh, best serve your interest today. So this is where you get a chance to sort of ask us a question. And at any time, you can go to the Q&A and ask Eric and me a question. We'd be glad to answer it today as we sort of navigate our way through the next hour as effectively and efficiently and as aligned as we can. <laughs> Talking about alignment and efficiency, I thought I'd throw those words in. So take a moment, jump into menti.com, and I'm going to have, I got another question for you, Eric, while they're answering these questions. And that is the one on, you know, just sort of your gut feeling of what you're looking at with imagery influencing neurobiology. Um, well, I think we've suspected that, but I mean, what are you thinking? What's your well, thoughts? Well, it, mu it must be happening. It must be happening because we know the influence of imagery on psychological states and a variety of psychological states. And obviously we know the influence of imagery on movement. So before any of that could happen, you're, you're changing... Uh, you know, all kinds of things in your neurology and, you know, from neurotransmitter to hormone release and so forth. So it must be happening, but we haven't looked at it directly at, at that level, at the cellular level, which is where we want to go next. Well, one of the interesting things with the idea of neuroplasticity of the, of the synapses and those things actually changing and some of the neuromodulators changing like uh, dopamine and uh, my mind just went a little blank, but the idea of, of how uh, our experiences are going to modify that neuroplasticity. And one of the things that I've been reading about is that the neuroplasticity they believe happens at nighttime while we're in our sleep. So we have the experience of it during the day. And then while we're in deep sleep, the nervous system is processing and actually moving through that neuroplastic part, the hard part of changing the biology. So it'd be interesting to throw that piece in there to see if people are rating their sleep in conjunction with their, you know, imagery and movement experience is to see if those that have good night's sleep and are having the same intervention actually have a better neuroplastic and biocellular uh, neuro neurocellular um, change would be cool. Oh, I would be, I would be pretty sure about that. Yeah. But you know what? But I'm always touting. I'm always saying, you know, uh, the same thing. But the fastest way to you, to change your movement is to change your mind, and and that's also because uh, synaptic weighting and synaptic change happen so fast. So you change your mind about the movement, and the movement changes. That's a very fast way. Yeah. And to change the muscles takes longer. It's you know. And to change the fascia takes even longer. And it doesn't mean those are not things you shouldn't do. But if you want something that works fast, then, you know, imagery is a great way to create relatively rapid neuroplasticity. And, and part of that is not just to brag about imagery and say it's so cool. It's also about motivation. So people think, oh, I have to work out and I have to train until this muscle in my six pack and the fascia until that, you know, releases or whatever. Or, you know, I got some more collagen being laid down in that area. Give them some motivational <laughs> things, you know, give them some imagery where they immediately feel a change. And of course, that's not going to change the fascia immediately. It'll need a lot more repetition, but it's very motivational for yeah. people. It's going to take so much work to change. And then imagery like this, working through the nervous system, uh, can create some immediate benefits well, for people. You're the pioneer on a lot of this. I mean, I think for at least making it known, Eric, I mean, I think back when I first met you 25 years ago at uh, I Adams or some event like that, that we were both at and thinking of how we were thinking more hardwired as to everything was structural. 
My, right. my plie is limited structurally. I have tight heel cords. And then you'd play the bone rhythm game. And all of a sudden we'd go down another, you know, 10, 15 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion. And just by releasing our hips or the image of the sit bones widening. And of course, you know, everybody in Polestar loves uh, your work and, and we've supported it from the beginning, but that was a big breakthrough for us and actually led into some of my dissertation looking at the idea of creating successful movement experiences for people that are in chronic pain and that having that successful movement experience shifted their paradigm. But we were creating that by using imagery that they could process. A lot of times as doctors, we use imagery they can't process. Can I, you know, it's very, you know, nice that you're saying all these things because I think still to this day, uh, looking at the fact that you first have to look at the kinds of function that's built into you structurally and then you add on functional exercise on top of that. So a lot of people should still learn, okay, what, are, what is the automatic movement of the femur and all that? But even before that, if you were told that, you know, your bone structure won't allow this or that, that's already negative imagery. If that alone is part of why it was difficult. Yeah, yeah. You know, you hear that, oh, my bone structure doesn't allow no. You know, I mean, <laughs> to yeah. do this, why even bother? <laughs> I'm built this way. This is the way I'm built. <laughs> yeah, hey. you know, it's like, you're not, if you tell someone you can do that, you're not built to do that very efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I won't even do it in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> or Instead I'm going to do, do it in a way that potentially can, you know, injure tissue or challenge. Exactly. Them. So in looking at the, looking at this first slide, Mm -hmm. um, just looking at what their interests are. I put up here efficiency of movement, dynamic alignment, anthropometrics, uh, basically looking at different body types, movement acquisition and spontaneous movement. And it looks like the top three are efficiency of movement, dynamic alignment, and working with different bodies, which I, we're prepared to talk about any of these topics anytime, but maybe we can put a little emphasis on those three today. I doubt we'll get to all five. And then, Melissa, if you can just show the next slide as a quick prioritizing a question, if everybody can answer this one. And then we're going to get rid of the screen so Eric and I can, can have a bigger picture of us for ourselves. <laughs> Where are you anyway? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I love this idea of these, these two areas in particular that you're focusing on right now. So you know, the idea of understanding the biology in conjunction with imagery and behavior or belief or perception of how we mix this behavioral science with the physiology and biology science, uh, things we've suspected for a long time because we see the change, right? I mean, a lot of times the change is immediate. And then if we think about sort of the, the long-term acquisition of it, you said something really important. You said the tissue, of course, adapts with practice and with repetition, right? And, you know, it's the idea of thinking that when somebody can implement, let's say, one of the, uh, one of the images that really helps them, and they can implement that on a regular basis in their class or in their personal practice and movement, you know, you will see the shift in the motor control, for one. So we know that the neuromuscular system shifts and always is seeking efficiency with the task. So a lot of times we'll see that. But I think more importantly and more exciting is this idea of working with the fascial gurus of understanding just the massive amount of science coming through the communication system that exists inside of our fascia. Uh, you know, being able to remove fascial tissue from a living animal, put it in a dark room and it's emitting light photons for up to you know, minutes after it's been removed um, from a living organism, just thinking of, wow, these tubules are talking to all the cells. The cells are very dynamic in their synapses, at least. We know that. Um, really, really exciting. Let's see what people put here. Um, Melissa, go ahead and show us while Eric is answering that comment. Okay, well, I just, my thought around this is, you know, like a lot of the research in imagery, especially, you know, motor imagery where most of the research is, is that uh, if you uh, rehearse the movement before you do it, um, afterwards, it's, it's better, right? 
Uh, but, and, and that is very interesting, but what about going, you know, further back even, you know, into, for example, the emotional aspect of that, like working with limbic system effects on that movement and working directly at the endocrine and cellular level, actually doing imagery in there. So instead of just looking at the results and then trying to, you know, find explanations, go directly into the tissue with imagery and see if that's measurable. No one has ever done that, yeah. but why not? Yeah. And, it, you know, some, I mean, maybe not, you know, measuring the amygdala, you know, stress response to, you know, on the cellular level, maybe that's a little bit complicated, but there's other things that we're, we're going we're gonna to look at. And so to go further back, so not looking so much at, okay, that the result looks good. So at the much earlier stage where the res these results are being created and look at the imagery is what is it doing there? Because that's, I think, the next step. Yeah, you I would be interested. The results. The, yeah. the, neural, the neuromodulators can also be measured. So the serotonin type, you know, 2A and the dopamine exactly. and those things that are tied to motivation exactly. and to satisfaction. I, exactly. I find that really interesting that when somebody has that successful movement experience or imagery that they've implemented, how does that change the whole neural response in the brain with the serotonin type 2A, which is thought to be cor corresponding to contentment or satisfaction. And dopamine we often talk about as being the pleasure uh, modulator, but actually I think they're defining it now more as the motivation modulator. And dopamine is the mode, it only gets released when you're like planning or thinking about what you want to achieve. As soon as you have it, it's like the dopamine is gone. In fact, gone. Dopamine is gone even, you know, pretty much before. And yeah, the serotonin for uh, for the contentment part. But I mean, one, you know, the, just to give one answer, which is only one answer, uh, movement is good if it feels comfortable to you, right? If you enjoy doing the movement, then it must be efficient on some level. Yes. But one of the things with, with that, with efficiency and good movement, there's, there's several perspectives there's the inner perspective. What is your experience uh, of this movement? And then what is the experience of the beholder? For example, you go to this, you know, incredible ballet performance or Cirque du Soleil and, you know, they're doing these incredible things and you come out and say, well, wow, that was such amazing movement. It was so beautiful and everything. But meanwhile, you know, on the stage, or they were wrecking their bodies. Yeah. Okay, so there you have the conflict like full on. So a lot of things they were doing were dysfunctional. They were pushing their bodies way beyond what they should be doing. They were hurting like super bad on every level, but the audience thought it was beautiful and what good movement, you know, like he or she are like fabulous movers, whoa. And they're basically short, you know, ending their career right there, out there on stage. So that, yeah. that's an interesting question. And, you know, let's, let's come back to that one, because I okay. think that is a good place for us to launch is that sort of external versus internal. And, you know, where's that feedback coming from and who's giving the feedback as to whether, oh, that was amazing movement versus that felt amazing to do it that way. Um, just looking at this slide, Eric, it's obvious that um, I just put up a couple things to see what they they how they weighed them, how they ranked them. So the highest ranked for them as far as agreeing was um, spontaneous performance of movement task. So being very natural, then dynamic alignment is useful in determining quality of movement. I think we need to address that. Um, quality movement always correlates to enhanced performance, which is what we we're just talking about. So this is gonna be a good, good place for us to launch on that. And the last one was the idea of static alignment versus dynamic alignment uh, as being useful. And so um, we might get to that. Let's jump back into that conversation, Eric, you brought up of, you know, looks good, feels good. Um, you know, they, when we teach a lot of times we have, uh, we provide and teach with external feedback. You know, let's move your pelvis in this direction or allow this to happen or reach there. And then the internal feedback is the question, right? How does that feel? What do you observe with that? What happens when you use this imagery versus that imagery? 
And let's let's go there. Let's talk about that external versus well, internal. Starting way back, you know, my experiences, first experiences uh, being in, in exercise classes, but especially also in dance classes and ballet classes was, it was all about positional alignment. So you got put, you know, shoulders and, you know, close your rib angle and shoulder blades down and, you know, just like endless stuff like that. And, you know, lift your pelvis, went on and on until you felt, I felt immobilized, yeah. literally immobilized. So, okay, is this correct now? And now I'm supposed to move from here. You know, it's like, I, but I can't really move because I'm going to wreck this great posture I'm in right now. And so I was thinking, this feels very conflicted. And it kind of eventually dawned on me, you can't, you know, on a certain level, you can't teach movement through a position because they contradict each other. Movement is movement and a position is position and we are not a statue in a wall. So that, that's where it kind of started. That's where it kind of like started for me, yeah? Is that if you want to, you know, align a wall, you know, we were told like, you know, stacking, like stacking the body, like bricks and stuff like that. I'm thinking, I think that kind of works pretty well for a wall, but, you know, I'm not made for not moving. In fact, we are not, we are very bad at not moving. You know, I mean, you know, that's basically the crisis we have right now. Yeah, exactly. um, we were we are specifically more than our ancestors, so more than the um, you know other primates, which are much less uh, adapted to a lot of movement. We are very adapted to a lot of like moderate movement, you know, hours every day. That's what we're adapted to, and and that's why I, I was wondering, you know, about this postural teaching. So if you try to move while you're trying to keep a position, you're going to create conflict and that expresses itself in tension. And as we know, tension is the enemy of movement. And so that's another thing. If, it, if the movement for the beholder looks tense and there's different ways that can be expressed, like uncomfortable, then the suspicion should be high that, you know, this is not efficient. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I like the idea of, you know, the observation, we talk about quality of movement versus quantity of movement. And a lot of times we're sort of stuck in the quantity and we, we feel or we see a quality movement. We don't quite know how to identify it, but we try to mimic it sometimes. And the mimic it is by trying to position correctly of what we saw or what we interpreted rather than what really is happening in that movement. Where are they allowing themselves to move? And that idea of novice to expert movement. So the novel mover will always over recruit, um, not sure where the movement or the organization is going to come from. I often think of riding a bike and, you know, they start out and they're jerking all over the place. And a week later, they're like, hey, mom, look, no hands and riding very efficiently on a bike. And, you know, this, this idea of moving from unconsciously incompetent movement, not knowing what they don't know into unconsciously competent at the other end and really it's not a end it's a you know it's a continuum but you know how do we how do we make that work i love the idea of um can't teach movement from a position and i think that's really important for the pilates teachers and the physical therapists that are on this webinar uh, because so often you know everything is assessed in static that's one of the things i put up there is like you know, does static alignment really tell us anything about movement? And I do want to preface this in the sense that most of us that are on the webinar right now are on that spectrum of pathokinesiology to performance kinesiology. And the key word is kinesiology, the science of movement. We need to understand movement. And so as a physical therapist, I'm trying to restore movement to a level of function or as a performance practitioner, I'm trying to enhance their movement performance um, however I can, whatever tools I can use. Any thoughts on, on that idea, Eric, of, of sort of that continuum of, you know, our specialty is movement that's on this webinar. We are movers, we teach movement, we restore movement. You know, what, what's one of the first things that you think of that you need to be an expert in to be able to work to work in this field well the you know one of the the things is that what does the, what does the person want to achieve so 
Obviously, mm -hmm. if they come to you in pain and they have an issue, uh, the number one goal is, is to remove the pain. And that mostly will involve, uh, involve of course, uh, improving function and in improving efficiency, but not always, interestingly. You know, um, compensation patterns sometimes are the name of the game. We, you know, as and that brings us into, you know, if you have a broken bone, you know, or something like uh, that, that you have to do a dance around it. So it might not be the ideal, most efficient thing, but it brings you, you know, out of pain. So that's the one, I think, side of the coin there. Yeah. But if you want to improve performance um, and performance, you know, unless you're talking about walking and running and some of the things we are structured for, but if you're talking about dance, uh, Pilates, yoga like that, you know, I'm going to contradict myself on a level very nicely there. You have form. You cannot get away from form. There is form. So if you want to be a dancer or you want to demonstrate a Pilates exercise, you have to show good form, right? And that involves a position. And so the question is, how can you teach form and the kind of forms we work with, all of us and exist with, but still maintain that dynamic alignment so that people don't say, okay, the goal is to look good in the mirror. You know, I mean, I'm not against that at all. It's great if it looks good in the mirror, but what if it also feels good and what if it's also efficient? So how to create that, that would be the goal. And I've had like arguments with people who say, oh, like for example, ballet wrecks your body. And I said, I don't agree. Ballet can be great exercise, but you have to really work on achieving those forms you know, with good function and in a dialogue um, with, with whoever's trying to achieve them, because especially if you look at some of those traditional forms, dialogue doesn't exist. You have the expert, the super guru expert, and this is how it is. And you have to get that form into your body. It doesn't matter if it wrecks it. And if it does next in line, you know, so that's the other extreme there. And we're, we're trying to be the nice ones here and saying, we can we can achieve that healthfully, but then we need that dialogue. And a lot of that world is not used to what we call student centered teaching. You know, with um, a lot of Juan Yeto's language lately has been talking about the idea of tissue adaptation, right? So the idea of sort of the Edo portal and some of Mike Fitch work work, work with animal flow and looking at how different ranges of motion, the mixed martial arts world, um, that the body needs to go into those and gradually increase the load in different direction, different planes, so that there is tissue, neurological, neuromuscular adaptation. And you said something earlier that I wanna go back to, and that was the, what the client wants, right? So one of the things we use a lot in, in pulse shows, we talk about uh, the ICF model, where they want to participate in. What do you believe you should be participating in right now that you are not comfortable participating in right now? And what activities does that involve? And what demand does the body have to participate in those activities? And where are you today? I mean, there's so many questions, right? It's like, um, you know, here's a couple of things that you would need to be able to do to be a, you know, semi-professional ballet dancer. Your body would need to be able to do these things. And this is where you are today. Is, is there a big gap between where we are today and where we want to be as a semi-professional dancer? And a lot of times I think we keep thinking like there's some kind of recipe that takes you from one point to the other point. And this is where anthropometrics come in too is that there's all different types of bodies and shapes of bodies and condition of bodies and some have longer torso, shorter torso. So how do you look at this idea and particularly from a teacher's perspective of, of receiving these different bodies, these different goals? And you know, that's what the webinar is about is this idea of how do we progress safely but also take them to where they want to participate. If they wanna do mixed martial arts or Cirque du Soleil, how do we get them there? How do we help they, them get there? I mean, it definitely depends on, uh, you know, what kind of martial arts, but definitely if it's going to be acrobatics or gymnastics or dance, is that, you know, you could come in and you can say, okay, 
sorry, you know, not enough hip mobility or, you know, thoracic spine to stiff or whatever. You shouldn't do this. And then what you end up getting often is someone, you know, in, in doing ballet or whatever, or, you know, another one of these forms and they have the perfect body, but they're not interesting to look at because they have they're not interesting to look at they're like it's like a machine like that they have it all but there's no sense of rhythm there's no sense of space there's no musicality which are all the fact of rhythm all the factors we just don't you know we just we're talking functional anatomy functional anatomy and fashion like that but hey that's not oh, all there is to yeah. movement yeah, there is a sense of uh, you know, if you know, moving your body in space with a certain rhythm and to use the word grace or, you know, all that, which is probably, you know, if you're efficient, then hopefully it'll look graceful and all that, but just fun to look at. I mean, if someone, and you know, that brings us into the limbic and all that system like that, often you have to reteach people in that field you know, why they even started to get, why did you start doing Pilates? Why did you start doing dance? Because you liked doing Pilates and you liked doing dance. And what has it turned into now? Like, a, you oh, know, so, yeah. you know, and, and all, all those factors come in there too. So again, it's, it's tricky also with different body types. So I would not, you know, if, even if I would see like, okay, this looks like this is not the body type for that. <laughs> I would still say, you know, go for it because who knows, they might have some other amazing quality, which they'll bring out in that form. And we're just all blown away. Yeah. And we've seen this over and over again. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, tenacity, you know, even in sports, uh, tenacity yeah. far exceeds natural ability in people that achieve high, high levels of performance. And I think, especially in dance and other activities where you look at some of these people and you think like this poor body, but their, but their emotion and their motivation and their passion, you know, and that's why I always ask, you know, what do you believe you should be able to participate in and get in the behavioral aspect of it? What do you believe is not allowing you to do it? I love to know what they think, you know, what we talked about a little bit earlier, what's their belief of why they can't, do they believe that their body doesn't let them do that? Is that a preconceived belief that, you know, controls the that actual movement of their body, which I happen to believe it does in a lot of ways, but it's the, that idea of how do we sort of recreate an environment that they can optimize their ability. We don't know what that's going to look like, but well, that's we one of them a shot. That's one of the big things, you know, like creating a motivational climate. So creating a climate uh, within which uh, the, the student can like excel. You know, what about that? And just even forget about all the te teaching techniques and the, uh, you know, efficiency and all that. Just an environment where the person feels in this environment, I can do my, my, my best. Yeah. And that's kind of a completely factor that not directly related to you know, this joint or that fashion. So creating that environment. And yes. the other, we say in the Franklin method, uh, you know, you don't get what you want, you get what you believe, right? So you want to be able to uh, do this exercise or dance step really well, but you don't believe, uh, you know, that you can do it. Um, so there, and then you have to, and that's exactly what you've been talking about is like, we examining okay what what do you what what do you really believe you know um and then just be careful with that because that's you're more likely to get that than than what you want yeah. and you know we have simple ways in the franken method where we we do you know like do little movements like that like you do an arm gesture and then you say i love moving my arms and you know like it's really healthy because it you know, really gets my scapula moving every like that. It's just like fantastic. And you say that as you do it, and then you ask the question, how much did you actually believe that? You know, and and then, you know, a lot of people will be, well, 80%, 50%, you know, no, I don't really love moving my and we all should move, we all should reach up much more because we are structured to do that, right? So we we, you know, we evolved from brachiators and you know. 
we don't do that enough. You know, we go to our studio or wherever, and then we suddenly we do that. And the rest of the day, you know, if we would walk down the street like this, you know, people would like move away from us. They would be scared, right? Well, so especially in New York, but <laughs> especially I have ever not to see New York. <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, in New York, they probably you know they, they would more. Like, in the one place they probably no one no one would even notice. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I I really I'm taking lots of notes, Eric. So if I'm looking down, it's because I'm writing I'm writing notes. I love some of these things you've said. Um, one of the things we know in research actually that confirms what you're talking about of uh, the motivation or climate and the belief leads to the outcome. There was a great study done by Peggy Roller, who I hope to have on here in the next month or so. And Peggy with Don Marie Ikes. I think you know Don Marie Ikes from the Pilates world. I don't know if you know Peggy right. from the PT world, but what they looked at was a group of people at high risk of falls and they had a high fear of falls. So there are two things. One, they had had an incident that took them to the hospital with a fracture uh, within the last year. And two is that they still had a very high belief risk of falls. And the hypothesis was what we call a null hypothesis where they said, there will be no significant change in their fear of falls following a 12-week intervention of Pilates in a group class. So in the group class, it was taught by a Pilates teacher. It wasn't taught by a fall specialist or anything like that. And they were just told to provide a positive movement experience for them. And so they're having this 12 weeks, two times a week of Pilates experience. And every uh, 93 subjects, so it was a big end. It was a big group. And they all came not only down in the fear of falls, they came out of the category of fear of falls. Oh, wow. Right. And, you know, and then they were able to maintain that up into the follow-up six months after they stopped. So, you know, it's, it's what you're talking about. The idea is that what do you believe? Well, they were having so much fun in a group. So there's the social aspect. They're with other people. They didn't have to be afraid of things with, you know, other people who had the similar kind of history. And there's lots of things we could hypothesize, but the bottom line was these people left the fear of falls category where if they had stayed in physical therapy, we would have had them going through fear of fall training that probably would have continued to promote the fear of falling to basically cover our butts in you know, mm. liability of all the things they have to do and carry with them versus they, had, they were having a great experience, a great social experience, they were moving and they completely left the fear of falls. And I think we're going to see so much more of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just have to create positive movement experiences. I was talking about um, Adrian Lowe, the fear of fall or the fear of pain, right? So pain avoidance uh, aspect of it. And the education combined with successful movement experiences reduces the pain uh, by more than 30% in the research. But by itself, it doesn't, and movement by itself doesn't necessarily do that either. There has to be some kind of behavioral aspect tied into a successful movement experience to be able to have these outcomes that we're talking about. Exactly, exactly. And the more you experience uh, success, the more you believe that you can be successful. And that's why I've experienced it's good to give people very easy successes at the beginning of a class. like. Something they, you know, absolutely can achieve. Like, okay, let's start with touch the back of your head. Very good, you know? Like, that's like, you know, very easy things. And then you get more complicated and more complicated uh, like that. But I think we should, for a moment also, just re go very, you know, to head on into like what is dynamic alignment just for a moment and dialogue a little bit like that and then what is efficiency so i'll just well, say before, something before, before we go there let's just answer sarah and Gen genevieve's okay. question real quick okay. and then dynamic alignment so sarah had a comment she basically was from early on was just talking about clients often come with a host of negative language from surgical right. experiences mris right. which we all deal with mm. um you know the doctor said it's the worst disc herniation he's ever seen in his life um, but those are those are things that um, we can, and this is part of the pain education, is decatastrophizing or desensationalizing um, without disrespecting. It's a, it's a fine exactly. line, right? You don't want to exactly. say you, you don't really have a problem. So that was one, and I appreciate you, Sarah, bringing that up. 
um, that's really important for us on the language. And then, um, Eric, I'm going to let you take this next one from Genevieve. Um, it says, how can, if it feels efficient, it's good movement. Sometimes it's someone's faulty pattern, but, they'd use, uh, but they're used to it, like valgus on a squat or something like that. Totally, totally. Actually, I will second that 100%. What you've been practicing will feel, you know, good. And then when you, you know, and, and, but if it's dysfunctional on some level, uh, and you try to change it, they'll first feel uncomfortable. Absolutely. So if you are, we've always had forward head and then suddenly, you know, we do some functional exercise or some image where, you know, they're like this, they'll go like, this is not me at all. I often ask that question. So now we're, you know, in a better posture, but do you really like your experience or does this feel strange? And for a lot of people, it feels very strange. People are used to uh, what they, you know, what they do most of the yeah. time. So, and, and one thing we say in the Franken method, you mostly get better at what you do most of the time. So <laughs> the question is, how do you get out of that? You're going to have to find a new mostly what I do, right? Yeah. And, you know, I always say the first thing, you know, the, the Franken method, first work on what you do most, which is things like thinking, like during, you know, this event, you've been listening to us, but you've also been having your own thoughts. So we're what the way we think is a practice as well. So that's the first one right there. Then breathing, you know, walking, all those kind of things. Those are the first initial patterns, but you're absolutely right. Um, it may feel uncomfortable at first if you move towards more efficiency because it's not has not been your experience. I sometimes then do the little neuron game where I say, if you're a neuron up there, you know, and then suddenly, you know, you're responsible for, you know, tense shoulders and the forward head. And suddenly the shoulders are more relaxed and the head is back. The neuron is going, what is this? This is not, we've lost our job. You know, we're here to create tense uh, sternocleidomastoids and, you know, trapezius. And now we're not supposed to do that anymore. No, no, no. Let's try to get back to the old pattern as fast as possible. So, you know, everyone can kind of understand what it is. But maybe also to the, you know, the, there's two other things that were in this and the other question like that. So one of the things we do when we start a class on the spine is we talk, we say, okay, we have a negative, a negative imagery and self-talk world when it comes to the back. So, um, you know, people will talk proficiently about their problems they have with their back in great detail. You know, it hurts here and it moves around the pain like there. And you fully acknowledge that, you respect that, absolutely. But then you look at, okay, what would it be if someone walks in and would be the opposite in his expression about his back? Like, oh, today my back feels so flexible and free and, you know, just all the muscles are so relaxed and the fascias are balanced. You probably think that's, that's really weird. No one ever talks like that. So we're very practiced in talking negatively and what we expect and the positive, like literally is weird for people. So... It's always the same thing. If you want to go from here to there, you acknowledge where you're starting from, pain, discomfort, like that. But we have to set a goal. We must set a goal. There's lots of research on that. If you don't have a goal, you're not going to find a new apartment or a new job or, you know, you have to like work it out. You have to invent in your head first, what is my the goal for my spine? How would I like my spine to be? And make that really strong. So it's becoming equally as strong as that other thing you have in your head about your back. Yeah. So that's what, and that's basically and the four steps, which in the world of, yeah. you yeah. know, about like starting, you know, what are we starting from? What's our goal? What are the tools we have to get the there? Measurable. Blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, there's a, we've been working with a group called uh, the Pacific Institute and they have a course that we've adopted called mind setting, which is a lot built around this, mainly because we all know how important belief and behavior is and setting goals and, and uh, those things, very important. Um, we need to jump into dynamic alignment. The next question is asking about alignment. So I figured we'll just jump right into dynamic alignment and you know, take it away. What were some thoughts you were having about explaining what is dynamic alignment first and then maybe discussing how we apply it? Well, I mean, there's different ways you could start this conversation. One is to say, um, you know, good posture is just a moment during movement. So not even to think of 
a position, but it's just a moment during movement. So even if you're not moving, uh, you know, you're still always moving. There is postural sway, there's the, you know, breathing uh, mechanisms, there's the heart, there's circulation, there's so many movements going on. So instead of identifying positionally, identify with all the movements that are still going on. So a posture is just the best place to be to do the next movement, <laughs> right? So a posture is just the, the best place to be to do the next movement you want to do would be another definition. Um, but, you know, traditionally it would be, you know, years over the chromions and, you know, trochanters and all like that. Um, and that's fine. That's probably a visual, internal and external way. We have a little posture class in the Franklin Method where we practice that and embody that, you know, using the cardinal planes. And then you have, you know, an imaginary central axis. So a central axis to be able to visualize that, which is the crossing line between, you know, the median sagittal and medial coronal plane. That's a very good image to start your dance around good posture. Of course, it doesn't exist. It's a mental construct. There is no central axis in your body, but it would be a good way to have a start, you know, being more dynamic around that. And this central axis is not a pole or something rigid, but it's something mobile flowing. It's sort of something oscillating. So basically your spine is an oscillator. It's always moving just a little bit. So to pass around the workload between uh, the nerve, the motor nerves, and to you know make sure the pressures on the discs and the joints is always shifting a little bit. So you don't get too much in any one area and no muscle fiber is being overworked. So in dynamic alignment, the workload is, even though you're not moving really, there is movement and you're constantly shifting the workload and you have an oscillating more idea of your posture, which really is, you know, what postural sway is about. And so, you know, you have this idea of the center of gravity over a base of support and in how that moves around the center of gravity over the base of support to the plumb line is a huge thing also in research. Because for example, you know that people with back pain, um, they actually have more static posture. So they have less postural sway. So I'm always thinking, so why, are we teaching people to be in positions when being more in a position and keeping it is actually where people with back pain go? You know, so it's kind of, and and it's what and, reproduces the secondary pain associated with a back injury. You know, it's the static holds of those muscles around the spine and the trunk that we know now are the very cause of a lot of the pain, the quadratus and the rectus spinae, and you know all of those muscles around the spine, the big muscles, the global muscles that are substituting to try to splint. And exactly. unfortunately, there's literature out there that, you know, from some very powerful producers of research that are using the model of splinting as being stability or core control, which is disastrous um, in my mind. I think that it's, you know, I love the idea of the oscillation and the image that I've used sometimes is, you know, if you had 24 blocks that were stacked on or slinky and it's in your hand because it's a really interesting structure, the human body, the verticality of it, the bipedal, but we're basically balancing this head and shoulders through a stack of 24 segments that there's always this kind of movement happening in a healthy person to be able to maintain that, like you, the oscillation. So I like the oscillation image a lot. Um, there, there's a question on the table now okay. that deals with a horizontal organization in the water as it pertains to alignment. And Irena said a uh, slight detour in swimming, alignment is very important and we all use our own version of alignment, a happy place as you both discussed. Do you believe Pilates can branch out to being done in a water? And I, I, I would answer that and just say, why not? Um, yes, why not? Absolutely. Why not? Movement is movement. You, you can. Exactly. And we are, you know, 60% or whatever fluid, uh, you know, and, and so to actually embody that uh, can be very helpful. And it's to do that in the water is absolutely great. So one of the big ways I, I think you can improve alignment, dynamic alignment, is by improving embodying function in literally any area of the body. 
So, you know, it's not like, oh, we need to first work on the pelvis. No, no, no. The key place is the atlanto-occipital joint. No, it's the feet first. You know, you could start anywhere and improve organization uh, and embodiment and it'll, it'll improve posture. So it doesn't even matter. You know, it's like, okay, where do we start from? Or, you know, if you, you look at someone and in the dialogue and, and through what they are wanting, you can start in there in that area of the body but of course there are some classic things that a lot of people express you know through bad posture which is you know around the shoulders forward head uh you know over pronated feet or imbalanced pronation there's many things like that classic things but basically if you improve movement you're going to get better posture mm. so i love to teach posture through movement not through putting people in a position i I told you I have that process, which I think is quite nice, but then mostly I like to, if you improve movement, if you give someone uh, a way to, you know, discover um, a better postural experience through movement, I think that is a very elegant way because then they'll feel the movement in the position. Mm. And the other thing is, is like, you know, not teaching postural cues that much, like, you know, lengthen your spine, drop your shoulders, you know, lift your pelvis, what, whatever, on and on, like a, you know, like that. But do something, you know, and we do a lot of that in the frank way, do things. And then suddenly afterwards, when it's over, we say, anyone notice the spine feels more lengthened? Anyone notice the shoulders feel more dropped? Anyone notice the back feels freer? There we have it. That's what better posture feels like. So mm -hmm. stop teaching and give the people the experience of what you're talking about. Yeah, amen. Right. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't teach the good posture, but do something. And there's many things you can do. And then afterwards, oh, anyone notice that posture feels more comfortable and shoulders more dropped and, you know, breathing is more free. Yeah. And then we of, make, one, yeah. One of the things we notice too is just as simple as distribution of movement equals distribution of force. So when exactly. we looked at, I remember years ago in 1995, we looked at, segmental movement of the spine of healthy people. And what we found is the majority of them moved from L5, S1 and L4, L5. And they didn't have any movement in the other segments from T2 down to L3 or L4. And then just putting them on, we did five exercises of doing roll downs and bridging and mermaid and some side bending. Five mm -hmm. exercises brought them back and they had a significant increase in segmental movement in their spine. But wow. the beauty was L4, L5, L5, S1 reduced by 50%. So if you're thinking of somebody, you know, again, this idea of um, being sedentary, right? Mm -hmm. So sedentary, we're going to have, like you said, the rounded shoulders, forward head, shortened hip flexors, maybe decreased internal rotation, decreased ankle dorsiflexion, all these other areas that are just from habit, I mean, you can go out and if you're moving, it's going to change those things. You have movement, then you're going to notice that you're walking, you're running, you're dancing, you're sleeping are going to be significantly better. And, you know, these are really important points that if you're listening in the audience today or the recording of it, this is something that we have been just hammering of the idea of just keep creating positive movement experiences and let their bodies learn. Their bodies will learn and they'll have good experience. They'll keep coming back. Um, that dissected day of teaching Pilates, that's, that's been gone for decades now. So sitting down and you know trying to nitpick something or the, we call it the cueing vomit, Eric, where <laughs> you're, just, you're just throwing up everything you can in some perfect static posture while they're trying to push their feet into the reformer. Um, it's, it's long gone, long gone. Okay, excellent, excellent, yeah. But, you know, one thing we, we you know, can't throw out is that, uh, you know, humans, especially, we're, we're actually really good, you know, cardiovascularly, and we have actually, uh, compared to, you know, other animals, we have very good Best. breathing apparatus. So I think that um, if, we, if we can breathe well, if our breathing feels comfortable, um, I think that is an expression of good posture too. 
So mm -hmm. we, we can't just look at skeletal or, you know, myofascial stuff. I think we should also look at organic stuff. Yeah. So does our posture allow for our lungs to expand properly? You know, it doesn't give space to the heart, you know, like mm -hmm. things like that. Digestion, um, blood flow, digestion, blood flow. flow. I mean, what does bad, bad posture do to digestion and the function mm -hmm. of all these organs, the kidneys? I mean, for example, um, you know, good posture, the kidneys need to be very positional organs. They have a certain space they have to live in. Otherwise, they're in trouble. And that's actually also part of posture, but hardly ever talked about, you know, let's align our kidneys. I was like, what? You know, <laughs> um, so or, I think we or move, as you said, move. The kidneys. Yeah. yeah, move the kidneys, move exactly. The kidneys, and yeah. it's like every time you breathe, the kidneys moved, you know, in the kidneys move down, down and when sure. you exhale, you move up again. Yeah. 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 And, you know, efficiency, you know, obviously it's just like energy in, energy out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of the world of training is is about inefficiency, burning calories. So that's a very interesting thing. Also, in the whole discussion, is that you know, in a way, to be fit, right? Um, exercise is stressing the body in a good way, yeah. and I think part of the discussion is also what is a good way of you know, putting some load on the cardiovascular and myofascial system. What is a, the healthy way of doing that? And, and the, all of the anti-aging literature too is showing that, you know, we have to have some of these stresses on our body to be able to have the right, um, you know, health of the cell, the right health of the system. Exactly. And that, you know, things like sometimes intermittent fasting or, um, temperature changes. We're seeing a lot of literature come out on exposing yeah. ourselves to more than the eight degrees that we live in with our air conditioning, heating homes and cars. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, learning to have some of that and that, that actually increases the genetic lifespan uh, of, our, of, of our bodies and things. Um, Eric, we're coming close to the end of our <laughs> hour. And you and I could continue for hours on this. I, I want to let you know that I really appreciate your influence in the movement world and i feel like you know you you've done such a great job of making movement accessible uh of using imagery as one of the key elements but then taking it you know the idiokinesis from years ago and moving it so far forward and making it available um, eric has a lot of education opportunities around the world so eric what do you have coming up here well, we have our a webinar coming up on the embodied brain, uh, which I told you about before. And then, of course, we have our level one, uh, which are which is our, you know, the classic Franklin Method training coming up in the fall. So if you want to learn what we're talking about, the Franklin Method, that is the course of choice. But in two weeks, I'm doing this is just a two hour thing. Um, and I think it's accessible time wise also to the U.S. audience. Great. So, and then we have a, a place where you can go to get resources and coupons. So we have coupons for you where you can do both of these courses, you know, with a rebate. Um, so there we have it, frankmethod.com, full star Pilates. Awesome. And we'll have this available in the after production for you to be able to, uh, to get to as well. So um, again, Eric, any last thing you want to say to the crowd on movement, dynamic alignment, ideal movements? I mean, uh, it, it sort of like sounds a little maybe, um, you know, emotional on a level, but I think that good posture should make you feel happy. So when I, you know, when I teach like a sitting and I say, okay, let's start with sitting upright and people go, this is so, you know, it's not fun. So then I say, okay, let's see if we can do some things where it's actually fun to sit in a way that's efficient and, and dynamic for your body. Because yeah. if it isn't fun, if it doesn't feel good, we're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Great words of advice. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, as we say, it's a good time to be good. So when you're out there, be kind. Uh, be nice to the people around you. Always make the assumption on the side of kindness. The world has enough conflict as it is. We'll see you next week for another thank webinar. You. Eric, thank you so much. Always appreciate it. Love you. We'll talk to you soon.